and good evening. Thank you very much for coming to our CASIA 2 Anterior Segment OCT Symposium. We have two key speakers here, which I like to introduce to you. One is Professor Christopher Leung from Hong Kong. And um, then we have Dr. Felix Gonzalez Lopez from Madrid in Spain. Um, yeah, thank you very much for joining and I hope you will have uh, an enjoyable time here. And uh, may I hand over to Chris? Can you? Thank you. Good evening. Um, well, I would like to walk through with you in this lecture, talk about how the application of, of anterior seminal CT can help improve the position of the assessment of angle closure and how such an, imp an improvement can change the way we manage patients with primary angle closure disease. Primary angle closure disease is a continuum with different stages from normal PACS, PAC, PACG is a spectrum of varying stages. And in some patients with PAC or PACG, some of them may develop acute angle closure all these terminologies are based on the idea that these eyes have narrow angle or angle closure. But how do we define angle closure? Typically, we rely on goniaroscopy. And the most common definition we use is when we cannot see the posterior trabecular meshwork for more than 180 degrees, then we will say these eyes have angle closure element. Uh, for PACS, is a condition where we don't have high intracular pressure, we don't have glaucoma. For PAC, we have high intracular pressure or peripheral anterior synechiae or both. For PACG, we have these elements together with evidence of glaucoma. So in this um, continuum, we rely very much on gonioscopy to give us a diagnosis of whether the angle is closed or not. The idea here is we have to be aware that all the clinical trials we have in terms of the management of angle closure disease, they are all very much depends on this definition based on goniaroscopy assessment. And we know for PAC and PCG, these eyes may need LPI, laser, peripheral iridotomy in order to prevent acute attack. And also in some cases, we can reduce intracranial pressure in these patients. For PACS, actually, we are less certain about whether LI is actually indicated. There are a lot of patients in Asia, and I'm sure there are also a lot of Asian eyes, Asian patients in the West that uh, they have PACS, but uh, we are confined uh, with the issue whether they really need uh, laser iridotomy. This is one of the landmark trials which indicate that LPI may not be indicated, uh, or we can say widespread prophylactic laser iridotomy is not recommended, it's what it um, mentioned in this paper. What this paper show here is they uh, randomized the same individual, one eye with LPI, another eye with uh, direct end treatment. These are all patients diagnosed with PACS and they followed them up over six years. And what they found was the risk of angle closure attack, the risk of development of IOP elevation or PAS was actually very small. For the treatment group, we're talking about 2% over six years. For the observation group is uh, about 4%. So the risk is very low over a very long time. That's why the paper recommended that it's not um, necessary to perform LPI for all individuals. But what we don't know here is who would actually need LPI. Here we have a case study. We have a 58-year-old lady came for a routine eye exam. Uh, we have this individual having normal intracranial pressure. The gonioscopy assessment is one. Uh, we, could, we can see the strobis line, but we couldn't see the posterior trapezoid meshwork for 360 degrees. This is the gonioscopy assessment. 
The OCT show normal looking retinal nerve fiber layer, normal looking ganglion cell in the platform layer. So the diagnosis here is compatible with primary angle closure suspect PACS. What we have here is we need to better understand the anatomy of the angle in order to better identify and determine whether this individual would need LPI. The Fundamental type of physiology of angle closure is relative pupil block. These elements create a pressure gradient where we have the pressure behind the iris higher than the pressure in front of the iris, creating an anterior convexity of the, of the iris. And this configuration is the root cause of blocking the angle and later on elevation of IOP and formation of PAS. That's why with OCT, what we can see here is this characteristic feature of angle closure, the anterior convexity of the iris. This picture was captured more than, 20, uh, uh, more than 15 years ago um, when I was a resident and uh, we used uh, time domain OCT, very slow speed, which allow us to only get one cross session at a time. What we had here is an eye with primary angle closure. You can see clearly the anterior convexity. And what happened after LPI is that we can abolish the pressure gradient. Because of that puncture, we eliminate the pressure gradient. And you can see the iris return to its original normal shape after LPI. And this is why LPI is useful in this type of cases. Angle closure defined by gonioscopy is a very different concept compared with angle closure defined by OCT. What we're interested in is whether there is iris adhesion or iris opposition at the trabecular meshwork. And here with anterior segment OCT, we can evaluate the structure in a more precise manner. And what we have here, we can measure the AOD angle opening distance or uh, trabecular iris space area, these are the parameters we use to quantify the angle width and we are also using these parameters to measure whether there is angle closure or iris trabecular contact. Here is the anterior segment of the image, we are just showing you the horizontal scan for that lady I mentioned earlier. The right eye, what you can appreciate is obviously the angle is narrow but there appear in this scan no evidence of iris trabecular contact. But for the other eye, uh, a certain degree of angle closure element, despite the fact that both eyes show angle closure by gonioscopy standard. So even with the same grading, we have varying configuration of the angle opening and varying degree of ITC. The CASIA 2 is a newer generation of the anterior segment OCT was introduced actually more than five years ago. It has a higher scan speed compared with the older generation and it has an increased scan depth, which allow us to see from the top of the cornea to the bottom of the lens. With this CASIA 2, we developed um, an algorithm with TAMI. Uh, we call it STAR, which stands for Scalespur Tracking for Angle Analysis and Registration. So what this algorithm does is we, I can identify the scale spur on some cardinal position. We measure, we identify the scale spur at four individual scans, and then the algorithm can automatically identify the scale spur in other angle locations based on the assumption that this scale spur all lie on the same plane. The idea would be that we would be able to quantify the angle dimension in 360 degrees, which is a very important way to determine whether an eye has angle closure or not. Earlier time, when we had um, the time domain OCT or many of the special domain OCT, swap sort domain OCT we are using, they have the anterior angle imaging module, but most of them would only allow you to take a few cuts. But 360 degrees imaging is especially important when we would like to identify whether an eye 
had angle closure or not. Here is a video clip demonstrating how the star 360 degrees uh, was performed. Basically, the software automatically identified the scale spur. We are not using an AI tool yet at this point, but it's an algorithm based automatic detection of the scale spur. But you can manually adjust the scale spur when it is not correctly identified. So after checking the scale spur location in this cardinal position, the uh, software automatically would generate the scale spur position in other meridians. In the latest protocol, we scan the eye in 18 B scans, so every 10 degree we would have a measurement. Uh, the software automatically process and segment the iris and the cornea, and this is what we get at the end. Each B scan, we will have this individual angle measurement. Uh, we can measure the lens dimension, we can measure lens curvature, as well as uh, the ITC. And here is the polar plot demonstrating the distribution of AOD 500, which is a parameter we measure the distance from the cornea to the iris. And in this case, uh, what we have here is we uh, conducted a study with um, a number of international uh, glaucoma specialists, people interested in angle closure uh, uh, from Japan, from China, from uh, US, from Singapore. And what we are interested here is to understand how we can use this new tool to better evaluate angle closure. And more important, how would that be related to the risk of angle closure and angle closure glaucoma in eyes with primary angle closure suspects? So there are a number of questions that we have addressed in this um, study. The first question we ask is where is iris trabecular contact detected in eyes with gonioscopic angle closure? So we study about 170 patients with angle closure. They have primary angle closure suspect or PAC or PCG. And we are looking at this parameter, AOD 500 equal to zero, which is in a sense, ITC. What we show here is a polar plot demonstrating the frequency in the individual axis along the different location meridians of the eye. The superior and the inferior quadrants are the most frequent areas where you find iris trabecular contact. And then the second question we ask is what extent, what degrees of ITC we would be able to see in patients with angle closure detected by gonioscopy. The y-axis here illustrates the cumulative number of eyes with uh, ITC, and the horizontal axis show total number of angle locations with ITC. And what we have here is about a third of this PACD, primary angle closure disease people, had ITC for over 180 degrees. Now, this is a very interesting finding. It also highlights the fact that I mentioned earlier, angle closure by gonioscopy is different from ITC by measured by anterior seminal CT. And I believe ITC is a more precise and a more reliable way to evaluate angle closure than gonioscopy. One reason pertains to the fact that we can always evaluate the angles in the dark using anterior seminal CT. But when you use gonioscopy, it is inevitable that you, there would be some light and the angle would be opened up. And that can underestimate the prevalence of angle closure. And this is why this light is important, demonstrating the disagreement between anterior seminal OCD assessment versus gonioscopy assessment. The third question we ask is, what's the prevalence of eyes with angle closure by gonioscopy actually having no evidence of ITC in, in anterior seminal CT. Actually about 15 to 17%, pretty high proportion of eyes with PACD actually had no ITC at all. The fourth question, the most important question we have here is what is the risk of development of PAC and PACG? These are the patients that are of more concerns in eyes that have gonioscopy uh, diagnosed angle closure. And it's important to highlight the fact that here we have 
ITC measured by OCT being related to the risk of angle closure, but not so much with the gonioscopy. So this is another angle, you can look at it, a way to highlight the fact that anterior side OCT actually is a more precise tool for us to evaluate angle closure. More important, it is related to the risk of angle closure uh, glaucoma and primary angle closure. The limitation of the study here obviously is a cross-sectional study. Uh, we need longitudinal study follow-up to validate what we have observed. Going back to this patient, so we had uh, this patient came to me uh, and we did the star 360 degree and it gives you a very clear idea that this eye had more than 180 degree of angles having ITC. And the left eye, what we have here is we have about 90 degree of angles having ITC. So the right eye is worse than the left. So what I did back then was I discussed uh, with the patient. Here is just some highlight demonstrating that there are some elements of angle opening, although the angles are narrow, although the angle would be diagnosed by as angle closure with gonioscopy, but with OCT, we can clearly demonstrate there's a gap there. The iris is not yet adhering the trapezoidal meshwork. I discussed with the patient the management because we are at, at an area where we don't really have an actual recommendation based on the long-term um, long clinical trial, uh, although it's not recommended to have LPI, but also I have to inform the potential risk of having or not having LPI. So I discussed with the patient, I tell her that the pressure uh, IOP at that point was normal, there's no evidence of glaucoma, the risk of PAC or PACG is actually very low. And after that discussion, the patient actually opted for observation. So that was in 2021, December. Now, one year later, she came back with this. It's pressure 64, uh, blurring of vision because of corneal edema. This eye had acute angle closure attack. So this is a scan. You can now see all angles were closed. And she had 360 degrees of ITC. So what we did back then was I performed uh, argon laser peripheral iridoplasty, which I believe is a, a, a easy approach to handle acute cases. LPI could be difficult because of the, eye, the fact that the eye was inflamed and the angles was closed. LPI actually is a very viable option in this type of scenario. The pressure went down to 25 one hour after the procedure, and this is what happened to the angle after a week when she followed up to the clinic. You can see the angles now uh, open up by LPA, LPI. Um, fortunately, there's no damage to the nerve. Uh, we don't see any um, loss of the nerve fiber layer over time. Uh, I think the lesson to learn here is uh, we need to have a good discussion with the patients and let them understand their, the options available and we make the decision together. So the conclusion here is that we found many eyes with PACS actually had no IDC. I think it's an important point to identify for these cases. LPI is unlikely to be indicated. We also know from the study that 360 degree assessment of ITC is very important to evaluate the risk of PAC and PCG because we have data supporting that for every 10 degree of angle having ITC, they are also having an additional risk of development of PAC and PACG. What we don't know at this point is how extensive of ITC should we consider to provide LPI. Now, going back to this case, this is the right eye. You saw that before. And you can see the extent of ITC is more than 180 degrees. And then for the left eye, it's nine degree. There are elements of ITC. So we need a randomized control trial to inform, for example, whether treating patients with ITC for more than 180 degrees would be protective for the development of PAC, PACG, or 
uh, acute angle closure attack. But this patient illustrated a point that uh, 180 degree perhaps could be a useful reference for us to determine whether LPI is necessary. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank uh, our collaborators and, and thank you all. Hi, thank you. Uh, the automatic skeletal spur grading, how often was it accurate or did you have to manually uh, move it? it, it it's pretty accurate uh, because in the BCK, obviously we don't want to spend time to look at the skeletal spur and every scan. That, that, that's not possible in the BCK. But for the tool that we develop here, we only need to carefully identify the scale spurs, make sure the scale spurs are correct in these four cardinal scans, and the rest actually can give us a pretty good assessment of the angle opening. And then we can use the polar plot to inform clinical decision. Obviously, the beauty of the printout here is not only we have the plot, but we have some um, capture from the individual meridians along the plot so that we can verify the, um, the measurements. Thank you very much. Are you now con conducting a study or uh, RCT to uh, determine the, the risk of uh, angle closure depending on the extent of, of the... Um, so I, if I understand correctly, you're asking um, the extent of ITC, how, how is it related to the development of uh, primary angle closure or primary angle closure glaucoma? Uh, we, what we show in the study is a type of continuous association, meaning that for every 10 degree of ITC we see, the, um, if I remember correctly, the risk of angle closure or angle closure glaucoma would be increased by 5%. So if you add this up over, to, over different meridians, the more uh, ITC you see, the higher would be the risk. Is this a longitudinal study or is it just comparison between? Uh, we, 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 we're doing a longitudinal analysis to validate what we observe in this cross-sectional study. So the study here includes cross. a group of patients with PACS, PAC, PACG. So what we don't have here is longitudinal data. We have longitudinal data, but we haven't analyzed it yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Chris. Very nice. Um, continuing with uh, Dr. Felix Gonzalez Lopez. Good evening. Thank you very much, Catherine, and all the whole team, Tomei, uh, for the invitation to, to speak here. Okay, my speech is about the significance of the trabecular iris angle in posterior chamber facet in trabecular lens surgery. So the, the first thing is I'm a refractive surgeon. I'm specialized in, in the field of facet lenses. This is uh, my publication, my scientific publication in this field. Uh, I attended some meetings about this, this, uh, this kind of lens and I have some, some hours and I, I even I compete with Chinese surgeons. You can see I'm here. Okay, so Chinese do have many patients and we don't have so much. So uh, I'm not a, a glaucoma man, so I want to apologize for all the mistakes I, I will make in this presentation. So let me introduce the posterior chamber facet lenses. This is some of the posterior chamber facet lenses that has been in the market, but I will focus it in, in this one, in the ICL, the implantable columnar lens. It's the most implanted lens uh, since 1997. It is made by, uh, by Star Surgical from the United States. Uh, we had studied two million of implants uh, worldwide in the, in the last 25 years. And I, want, I, I like to show this, this work from the ophthalmology 2016. It was published there uh, from Holden. We stay here and we are going here. We will have one million, one million, sorry, of my high, height myopic people in the world in the 2050. This is the prevalence of myopia I expected in 2050. So the trend is to have more and more myopia. And there are some uh, surgical procedures to correct the myopia, but the fucking lens is, is the only procedure to successfully correct high myopia in young people. 
some of the advantages uh, of the of the ICL procedure are that they correct a, a wide range of refracting errors with very predictable refracted outcomes and quickly achieve it. Maintaining crystal lens integrity is a commodity function, so its implementation has not been associated with retinal complication. Being implanted in the posterior chamber of the eye is nodal points are very close to the crystalline lens, which produce a magnification of the retinal image compared to other options for correcting myopia, either in the spectacular contact lens or corneal laser uh, surgery. Uh, due to the quality of its material, colamer, the colamer, there have been no reported cases of, uh, cases of intraocular deterioration. Both in beds and in, in vivo tests have shown super optical quality, and the optical aberration related to corneal refractive laser treatment obviously does not occur. They preserve the cornea, as it is very important for the future, maintaining the optical quality of the ocular refractive complex, especially important in the future lens treatments, and enable the possibility of corneal treatments associated with fucking lens, that we call bioptic. Implantation is a potentially reversible process, and the surgical technique is relatively simple and standardized. That's very important for, for us, uh, for the surgeons, for the refractive surgeon, that we preserve the cornea with this uh, technique and the crystalline lens for further treatments. And we have the plan B. The plan B could be the bioptics in the cornea, could be the IC, ICL change, or could be the crystalline lens surgery. This is the current available uh, lens we have. This is the, the models EVO and EVO Plus. EVO Plus. Uh, there are four sizes, uh, 12.1, 12.6, 13.2, and 13.7. It corresponds at its length in, in, in millimeters. And they reach up to 18 diopters in, in myopia, up to, up to six diopters in, in astigmatism. This is the evolution of the vision ICL, the different models we have. But it was in 2011 with the advantage uh, with, the, uh, with, with this model, with the, the launch of this model, the V4C, after that the Evo Plus, with the uh, 360 microns uh, port uh, in the center in the optical zone, with, uh, was designed to provide natural aqueous humor flu without the need of iridectomy. We, it was at this moment when, when, when the, the ICL story was uh, rewriting. Uh, here you have two uh, different uh, lens. The, in, in your left side, you will see uh, this is from the Cassia video application. Uh, it's, it's, it's very amazing. We have the, the vertical uh, section in the, in the left. It's, it's a no central pole lens. You will see that the, when, when the, the, okay, okay, here. When you see when the when the movements of the crystalline lens and the, the the iris pushing down the lens, the flow of the aqueous humor is going through, run through the, the iridectomy. But in case of the of this lens, the the synergic movement of the crystal of the pupil and the the crystalline lens, they do that the the aqueous humor goes uh, just directly in the in the center of the lens. So that is very uh, interesting. I ask for a, a star company that. Uh, based on this, uh, in this image from, from the Cassia to, yeah, to perform this, this animation. And you can see the theoretical movement of the humus hacker uh, through, running through the central pore, how it diffuses in the, in the posterior chamber. And it, it's, uh, that probably is the reason because this complication, like an anterior segment, uh, cathrats or uh, acute glaucoma with this uh, model, has almost uh, disappeared. We had to talk about the ICL, we had to talk about the bolt. The bolt is the finer, the physical distance between the back surface of the, of the lens and the interior surface of the crystalline lens. And it's uh, traditionally the, the, the main concern uh, in, uh, about the safety of the, uh, of the vision implantamer collamer lens. We had been talking since 1995 uh, about the, the bolt. And uh, it was in 2011 when, 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 the, when we started with the application of the dynamic application of the, when we started to work with the dynamic application of the, of the Cassia, uh, we developed this uh, concept, the dynamic ball. Uh, we, th we thought, or we think, that this a paradigm shift in the ball assessment. We define it, these two dynamic concepts, the ball interval refers to central ball values measured in maximum hydriasis and meiosis expressed in microns after external light induced pupil change in the ball range, that is the calculate difference between the two values obtained after these measurements. 
the ball range in this lens in this series was 153 with a standard deviation of 73. So it's, it's quite a lot uh, because uh, our target uh, uh, our target in the vault in the ICL usually is 500. So you can imagine that is too much. You have you can see here the, the dynamism of faculty lenses of different faculty lenses. You you can see the changes here. But bold is in relation with the ICL sizing. So uh, the, in the sizing of the ICL, we have the lens size, we have the lens power because the intrinsic ball of the lens is associated in relation with the lens power. We have the diameter parameters, we have the pupil and anterior second dynamic, and we have the optics position. But really the sergeant, the only who, who can modify it is the, is the size of the lens. So the ICL size is in relation with the angle with the ball is in relation with the angle. So let's start it to talk about the trabecular IS angle in the relation with the, with the, with the ICL, with the Cassia 2 and the other uh, anterior segment um, device, we can uh, perform OCT device, we can for, perform a lot of uh, measurements. We can perform the angle to angle, that's very important for the calculation of the sizing of the L, the anterior chamber Y, the crystalline lens rise, lens rise very important also the pupil diameter also, but uh, also we can do measurements in trabecular ears angle, you know, these measurements, uh, the angle opening distance, the angle recess area, the trabecular iris space area, but we will focus in this trabecular iris angle, the TIA, because uh, TIA is very important for us when we are ma managing say, the, the ICLs. TIA is a, it could be a, a little, a little mess com a, a concept. We started with the scleral spur. From the scleral spur, we draw a line in the, in the posterior back surface of the cornea, 750 in this sample, 500 or 250. Then a vertical line from, from the iris, and from the iris in this point, we go to the uh, angle recess. And the, from the angle recess, another, uh, we draw another line, and this is the, the TIA 500, the TIA 500, sorry. So, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult, it's a little bit difficult, but you don't have to worry about that because Cassia do automatically for you. This is the measurements that they do, and for example, in an eye just before the, the operation after to do the implantation of the ICLs, we have all the parameters in the horizontal section. In here, we have the parameters of the, of the, of the anterior chamber, the other biometric parameters. Here we'll see that the pre-op, the change in the in these parameters in the iris measurements, uh, pre-op, post-op. Post Here's pre-ops, the, the, the trabecular iris angle in post-op. Here pre-op, the angle opening distance in post-op. Here also the angle recess area pre and post. And the trabecular iris space area uh, before the surgery, after the surgery. So uh, the, the next question will be, which are the normal pre-op and post-op TIA values? So uh, in this series we published in 2019, uh, this series is a 65 first implanted Caucasian eyes, first eyes implanted in, 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 in the patient. Uh, the age uh, was uh, 32, the mean age was 32 years old, and the, the main, mean equivalent, spherical equivalent was about 10 diopters of myopia. So the TIA 500 was in the pre-op about 50 degrees in, term, in, in scotopic conditions and madresses, always with the ambient changing late conditions, if not with drugs or with madresses with medication. And uh, it, it was about uh, the myos in photopic condition, it was about 30, 58, 59. So the change it was uh, uh, approximately uh, eight, nine degrees from scotopic front uh, photopic condition. And in the post-op, we will have the scotopic condition uh, about 30 and the uh, photopic conditions uh, in about 30, 30, 37, 38. So the chain again is about six, seven degrees. And we, we analyze the pre-op in the post, we, we compare the scotopic and photopic condition. We see also that there is a chain that is about 20 degrees in scotopic nasal and temporal and also in a photopic and temporal nasal. So to, and to have a, in mind about the reduction in TIA 500 after ICL implantation is about 20 degrees with a standard deviation of 10 degrees. So the ICLs have relationship with the bolt, with the angle. So which is the relation of the size calculation with the angle? 
So in the citing formulas of the ICL in the literature, we have many, many every year, we have many uh, formulas, new formulas uh, published in the literature, and even we have new calculators uh, in, the, in, the, in the web. It may, it, it, they, they are, these formulas are based on the measuring, uh, new measuring device and new measuring parameters. And even the, 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 the CASIA 2 has this application, CASIA 2, CASIA 2 Advanced, the application of the ICL size. So we have two formulas, Nakamura formula based on three optimization in publicis, uh, um, optimization pub, uh, the formula. And also we have uh, the Kimiya Shimizu formula, all from, from Japan, all these both formulas are from Japan. And this, it, it, this was published by Igarashi from the, the in, in the team of the Kimiya Shimizu. So the Nakamura formula is based in these parameters. So uh, this uh, ICS size calculation are based in uh, traditional biometric parameters of the anterior segment. But uh, last year it started, we, we work with, with this concept, uh, just to try to calculate uh, the ICL base on travelcular iris angle. And this uh, work uh, from the, this Japanese author, uh, it was a multiple regression analysis for predicting the post ICD. After that, they th he tried to, to, to do the, the prediction in a multiple regression analysis for post IA. And he did a, a verification of in, in 58. So in, in, in this is what I, I want to remark to highlight it. The mean prediction was three 0.5 uh, degrees with a standard deviation of two degrees. So it's amazing the, the projectile. But uh, this work was made in Japanese eyes. So I don't know if it's, uh, we can extend the results to the rest of the, of the races and, and the kind of eyes. So uh, the question is, is there any difference between, for example, Caucasian eye and Asian eyes? So uh, I compared uh, just two, two series, one from, from Korea, the from Camilla, and another one from, from us, from Caucasian eyes. And you can see that the most, choos the cho most chosen uh, size in Asian eyes are 12.1 1 and 12.6, the, the smaller one. And in Caucasian eyes, we have more variety. We have 13.2, 12.6, and some patients have 12.1, some spaces are bigger, and we, ha we have 13.7. So we can conclude the anterior segment of Asian eyes are smaller than Caucasian eyes. Uh, this is a typical Chinese eye, where we have say, a, a small uh, anterior chamber depth, and we have uh, also a, a crystalline rise very positive. So that's the reason because it's more difficult to implant ICLs in this, in this uh, type of eyes. I have some, some experience in Chinese eyes. So uh, in this relation, uh, again, we sometimes we find this. Uh, for example, this patient has a, a very high ball, more than 1,500. That is a very, very high ball. Even in the week, we do the vertical section, we, we see that they're very close to the, to the, to the endothelium. So, is there any cutoff value for TF500 to decide with the, the ICLS plants? Well, uh, in, and I'm not sure that it's correct as I look for in the, in the um, literature. And in, the, in this Kumijima study, they say that in the, 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 the cutoff value for TF500 could be in photopic condition 15 degrees in, in normal eyes, in virgin eyes. Uh, okay, so yeah, we come back to the, the sample just before, and we, have, we can see here that uh, we have uh, 15 degrees and 20, 20 degrees, so in temporal nasal. So I think it's very, very uh, strange, very narrow, uh, narrow angle. So we, we I, I look for another sample, for example, this uh, that's also with a very high volt, also with very narrow angles, and we have 20 degrees. So still, still very narrow for, for to leave the, the lens there. But sometimes we have this kind of eyes, and you can see here, it's not bad, it's not, I like it, okay? It's a very high ball, it's more than 1,000 microns, but the dynamic of the pupil is very well. So sometimes it's because this reason, uh, we have sometimes a very, very flat insertion of the crystalline lens rise, so we have a negative, ne negative crystalline lens rise. So that's the reason why sometimes even with a, uh, 
uh, narrow angles, we can leave the lens there without any problem. And also, for example, here we have opening angles and, 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 and very opening angles in the vault is, is quite high. But sometimes happen that this, the, the, the vault is, is high, but the angles are not very narrow, but the dynamic of the pupil is not very good. So I exchanged this lens, I, I inserted at 12.6, the other one was 13.2, and you can see that the dynamic is very good. It's much better, the patient uh, complains before the, the exchange, complains about the allos and, 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 and some difficulties in, in focusing and now the patient is very good. And we analyze with the front camera of the Cassia, we can see this, that the, uh, oh, sorry, maybe I come back. I don't know, I come back, okay. It's, it's not moving, okay, okay. It's not moving, but it's, it's amazing. You can see in the booth <laughs> because the, it, there is a completely different movement of the, uh, the stop the, uh, the videos, I don't know why. Okay, anyway, is there any cutoff value for 500 to decide this? Not yet, not yet. Because the, we have the relatives in of vault. Uh, the relatives in of vault, relatives is a family of philosophical views which deny claims to objectivity within a particular domain and assert the valuation of the, in that domain are relative to the perspective of an observer or the context in which they are assessed. So that's very important, the context in which they are assessed. So the relativism of vault will be that the ball must be assessed in relation to the biometric parameters and the dynamism of the ocular anterior segment. I don't know what happened with the videos, okay, they have stopped, but they don't. So ball is, is dynamic, a ball is based on the crystalline lens rise, it's effective for the, for the um, pupil pushing, it's effective for the widening of the anterior segment with the movements of the eye, it's effective for the optic positions, for the ciliary sulcus anatomy, but the ball is also related. So the key messages in this presentation will be that anterior semi OCT currently represents the best tool to analyze the pre-op and post-op of posterior chamber faculty lens surgery. The CASIA 2 dynamic application uh, allows to study both the ball of the lens and the trabecular areas angle in a very predictable and reproducible way and according to the movements of the pupil and the, all, all, all the other structures of the anterior segment. And trabecular iris angle analysis is gaining more and more weight in the preoperative pre evaluation of faculty lens implantation, complementing the postoperative all prediction formulas. So thank you very much for, for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, yeah, it's your turn now. Do you have any further questions to Felix's presentation? Very nice videos, by the yeah, way. It was, the, yeah. At the end, I, I think the, yeah, the machine was, it was really, the device was very tired and yeah. don't move. Okay, but. Great samples. So. Yeah, but the, the video application of Cassia 2 is really, really amazing. It's very useful. I think it's a, it's a revolution in the, in the analysis and the assessment of the ICL and the faculty lenses. And I, I'm sure that it will be a revolution in the assessment probably in glaucoma, I don't know, yeah. but probably, I think so, and sure in the south of Africa, so it will be, yeah. Thank you. I, I have a one, one question. Uh, we know um, from cross-sectional study and perspective study, the angle narrows with age, and it seems to be more so in the younger age than the older age groups. Mm -hmm. And in the assessment of the TIA, for example, in your case, how, how, how would you take that into consideration, the age of the patient, given the fact that the angle becomes narrower and narrower over time? Yeah, it's it's uh, okay. It's an important question. Um, we have the evidence of that after 25 years of uh, in the market, the, the ICL we started in Europe in 1997. The first implant was in 1993 with Roberto Saldivar, and after that, 1997 it was in Europe. And since that, uh, there is no, uh, there are there is only few cases. Only uh, I, I didn't have time to talk about here about the glaucoma and ICL the relation, but only uh, there are few few cases of uh, in the literature, uh, and I'm, I've never seen and I've implanted a lot. I never seen a glaucoma pigmentary after the ICL, so that you, you can find, you can, you can think that okay, the, the ICL is is uh, all the time in contact the, the, with the with the pigmentary uh, epithelium of the iris. So it's it's amazing that 
in all the movement we do in, in we have in the in the pupil in, during the day there is no pigment dispersion so it's it's for me it's amazing it's incredible because it's in, in contact in completely contact so uh, that that that's true yeah you, you are probably glaucoma surgeon so maybe maybe you have some cases with glaucoma and ICL but really it's very 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 strange to see so I don't know I don't know what it will happen in the future maybe uh, the, the the angle is it's closed here in the horizontal uh, meridian, but maybe in the in the vertical meridian is more opening. Okay, I don't know. But the, the real is that we have more than two million in, uh, implants in the world, and the glaucoma is not really a, 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 a issue of concern in in ICL implantation. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> What a wonderful uh, speech as we heard today. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for your time and for your effort to present um, these presentations and also with Acacia too. Thank you very much for all your effort. And yeah, thank you for being here and for joining us tonight. Primary angle closure glaucoma is uh, in, an important form of glaucoma in Asian eyes. Evaluation of the angle width is tremendously important in the risk assessment for patients with angle closure. When we evaluate angle closure, we really need to get a cross-sectional view. And more important, we need to evaluate the angle in the dark with gondoscopy, it's often inevitable that we need to rely on lights to visualize the angle. And that can actually underestimate angle closure because with lights, the, ang the pupil constricts and then the angle can be opened open up. Assessment of ITC with anterior seminosity is critical. We can analyze frame by frame, B-scan by B-scan, to quantify the angle in a reproducible and objective manner because we all know Gonioscopy suffers from high inter-observer as well as intra-observer variabilities. So these are the two key advantages of anterior CT over gonioscopy. We have been working around the ICL vault in the last 25 years, and still we haven't been able to do it with accuracy. The CASIA 2 is an advanced imaging system that allows to assess the pre-op in the post-op, the faculty temperature chamber lens surgery. It allows in an ambiguous view of the structures of the anterior segment, and its relationships one with another one. It permits its allows in a dynamic way. I mean, you can see and observe and you can measure uh, the change of the vault and the pupil dynamics uh, with the, the new application. We have to work in, in, on it. And uh, that's, uh, it's amazing for me. The anterior segment actually gains more and more interest. As we could see in our talk, we could see it's helpful in refractive surgery, especially with Farkic glances, but also in a complete different field such as glaucoma. Um, cataract surgery, any kind of surgeries, it's just um, a helpful tool on a daily base with the ease of the use. For us, symposiums like that are very important to spread around how easy it is actually to obtain data and also to work with the Casia in a daily base. For the patients, it's very important to have as most convenient as it could be to take measurements, uh, to give them the opportunity to see as well as a patient what the doctor is do doing with his measurements. On the long run, I think it's good for the, for the clinician because they save a lot of time, because the Casia does so much things other multiple devices would do as well. So with one device, you get plenty of information and it's a real benefit at the end of the day for the clinician to have these important information and also to gather information as much as the Casia can provide.